Harvesting honey is why you all signed up for this class, probably. You want honey for yourselves and for all your loved ones, and you want that good stuff from your own backyard hives. So you've been working now for a year and a half, <coughs> almost two years, you've been working with these bees, you've gotten sunstroke and bad back and you've gotten stung, and now it's finally time. You've got boxes that look like this. That's right there is where you stuck your finger in because you had to taste it. But Honeybees, believe it or not, honeybees like honey almost as much as we do. So somehow we've got to get the bees off of those combs in order to collect that honey for ourselves. Some people try to smoke the bees off. That doesn't work. When you smoke a bunch of bees, they just cling to the comb. They go down inside to get away from the smoke. That does not get the bees off. This is a bee escape board. And these used to be real popular, but not so much in the south anymore. And the reason is because small hive beetles. It's a one-way exit, so you put this on top of, of the brood below the honey, kind of where a queen excluder might go, and the bees go down, and then they can't get back up. So in a couple of days, your box full of honey has no bees in it. Sounds ideal, right? Except these stupid beetles are everywhere, and if all of the bees go down into this box and leave the beetles behind, within two to three days, they can ruin an entire honey crop. So... Be real careful with these, don't leave them on too long, but they actually do ha still have some uses. I'll show you here in a second. If you've just got one hive, two hives, not getting a whole lot of honey, you could just take your bee brush out and you could brush off each comb. So what you're doing in this case is you're gonna have a buddy help you, have an extra honey super, and you gotta have a lid on top of it and put another lid upside down on the bottom so no bees can get in. So each comb, brush all the bees back into their hive. Don't stand over here and brush them out in the air because then you got bees everywhere. Knock them back down in the hive, hand it to your friend, he quickly opens the lid, puts it in, closes it up to keep the bees off while you're doing another one over here. And if you've, if you've just got a couple of hives, then uh, you can do that. You can also use like a shop vac set to go backwards so it's blowing you can blow all the bees off of it and you can do one comb at a time but of course doing it with a brush or, or blowing it like that is is not uh, going to be very easy if you've got dozens and dozens of hives some people will do this with a leaf blower you want to be dressed like this guy not like that guy and don't put it on top of your hive and then blow them all at your neighbor's back porch you want to move it far away from your hive and then blow the bees back towards where they came from because those bees are going on a wild ride and then when they get done they're coming right back where they started so you want to blow them back toward their hives and not not back at you if you're standing at the hive this guy is probably just uh, blowing the last few bees off of it it's it's not something that you would necessarily do all of them with but maybe you've taken them away from your hive and there's a few bees left you could do that but after trying a lots of different methods this has got to be like magic. This is called a fume board. And whoever discovered this, God bless him. He was, he was a, a smart cookie. But this is uh, just a wooden frame and it's got a piece of absorbent cloth on it and then it's got a sheet of metal on the other side. And you use it with a bee repellent chemical. And there's a bunch of different ones out there. Uh, these over here are just sickeningly sweet. They smell like uh, almonds and maraschino cherries and and it's not bad but it is overpowering this one bego it's uh, it's got a chemical in it called butyric acid and it smells nasty it, most people describe it as dog vomit and if you get any on your clothes you might as well just burn them you sure don't want to spill it in a vehicle but it repels not just bees it repels everybody but it repels bees really well and these other ones do the same thing. They're not quite as effective, but given the pros and cons, uh, I, I prefer the stuff on this side. So you take this fume board outside, you spray a little bit of these chemicals on it, you put it on top of the hive, and in the bright sunshine, of course, the top here heats up and it vaporizes and all the bees in the honey super go swoosh down to the next box. Not all. 99% of them, but there's always a few staggering around in there like they don't know what just happened. It's usually the drones. But uh, after a little bit of time, 
you can take this box away. All the bees are down by the front door going, oh, that's awful. I can't believe you did that. Who was that? And they're all blaming each other. And then you're over here wheeling away all of their honey. When you take honey supers off, cover them up. Otherwise, as soon as you move them away from the hive, there's bees all over them again. So maybe there's a few bees left. That's when you can drag them away and then get your leaf blower out after that. But uh, after a little while, that smell dissipates and, and they'll be back to being fine. You know, traditionally, honey was just harvested in the comb. People bought it, sold it, traded, it, eat it in the comb, uh, just as it was. That was nature's candy, just as the bees produced it. And for most of human history, honey was the only sweetener we had until we discovered sugar beets and, and cane sugar. So when we hunted and gathered, this was a, a rare and valuable commodity. If you found this, it was high calorie and it was delicious and there was nothing like it. Now, of course, we can buy honey anywhere and there's all kinds of sugary sweets. We probably don't appreciate it as much as ancient people did. But in a lot of places in the world, People still like comb honey. They think that it attests to the purity of the honey. Well, when it's an open comb like that, you could pour anything in there. It's not the way the bees produced it. And let's face it, anything the bees encounter, they'll put away. You could feed your bees Mountain Dew and they'd put it in the comb. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's natural. This is an urban wildflower. You, you see them blooming a lot at <laughs> gas stations in the summertime and, and stuff. So yeah, your bees probably lick up a little bit of root beer and, and Pepsi Cola once in a while, lick a few candy wrappers and popsicle sticks, but that's a literal drop in the bucket as far as, as what they're gathering out there. So I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about that too much. Now I, I showed you this picture earlier, how bees build comb and they fill it in. You can actually buy little boxes, wooden boxes or plastic boxes that, that fit in little racks and you, you slide them down inside frames and bees will build little sections, this is called section comb honey, and you can convince your bees to build these and then you can pull them out after they're capped off and you can sell them as, as unique little, little boxes. Some people really like comb honey, it's kind of a niche market. If you don't produce comb honey and you sit at the farmer's market, all day long people come up and say, do you have any comb honey? And you say no, and then you decide, maybe I should produce some comb honey. And next year you have a big basket of comb honey, nobody wants it. So go figure. If you uh, are wanting to do that, you can also just cut it right out of the comb. Remember, no wires, no plastic foundations. You can stamp it out using a big square cutter. Put it over a rack and let it drain because all the, the edges that you slice through are gonna, gonna dribble out. But make sure that it's all capped off. If it's uncapped like that, it's just gonna drain out and you're selling your customer empty comb. You can save these pieces here along the edge, and those are useful too. But uh, you, they sell all kinds of packaging that goes with these comb cutters, and, and some people really like this stuff. Or you can find a do-it-yourself option. This is from a top bar hive, which is why it's a trapezoid shape. So you can, you can stamp out honey combs and find something to fit them in. And then, uh, of course, the rest of it you can process down. But that little, little piece there that you cut off the edge, this is called chunk honey. So you can put that in a jar, fill the rest of it up with honey, and, and a lot of people like this. Um, if you don't have a lot of processing equipment, then you can do what ancient people did. It's called crush and strain. So basically, you beat it all up. You open up every single cell using whatever implements of destruction you can find around your kitchen and be aware that you will never get all the wax back out of your kitchen strainer if you start doing something like this. But you just uh, let it sit very slowly, gravity strain it out, and you'll get a lot of wax after you get the honey out. But on a small scale, if you have like a top bar hive and you want to just harvest one comb at a time, there's different ways that you can do this. Uh, the more comb you're trying to process at once though through this method, it starts to be a big mess and a lot of work and you might want to just uh, invest in, in some equipment to process it, which I'll, I'll show you here in a second. But this, uh, this bucket here, if you're going to go to to the hardware store and buy buckets for honey processing, make sure the buckets say they are food grade plastic. You can buy them at restaurant supply stores, some hardware stores will have them, but these orange buckets, you know what store that's from, those are not necessarily going to be food grade. There's no telling what they recycled to make those, and you may not want to put your honey in it. 
You can go to the paint section and get nylon bags that are, are for straining paint. Sometimes paint gets debris in it. You can get a paint strainer and you can set up something like that and you can filter out a lot of honey that way. Uh, you can get online and find all kinds of things people have built. I love this one. It's, it's got two metal plates here and a big bag of comb and it's got a scissor jack and you can just squeeze it all together and it, all the honey drips into a bucket and then you have cakes of wax left over. So if you're doing this method, you harvest a lot more beeswax. So plan to make some candles or find somebody who wants some. Uh, you know, this is a, a cider press. This is a sausage maker. You can find pictures of all kinds of things people have, have decided to use. But again, you're never going to get all the, the wax out of that to make jelly again. You could probably pour a lot of boiling water through it and eventually get it pretty clean, but it's a lot of work. But people like extracted honey because we're lazy, right? We want somebody else to do all the work for us. We're so lazy now that we don't even want a glass jar we don't even want a squeeze bottle, we want an inverted squeeze bottle so you don't have to turn it over and wait a whole 15 seconds for the honey to get to the other end. These are dripless jars and the honey's always at the bottom so you can squeeze it right out onto that biscuit for the man on the go. Bees cap their honey with brand new wax. We call this the cappings wax, it's white. And it's, they secrete brand new wax to, to cap the honey. Brood combs, they recycle wax. They reuse it a lot of times, but with this, it's brand new. So when we extract honey, we remove it from the comb by slicing off the cappings. And we can save that. If you want to make lip balm or some other cosmetics, hand creams, things like that, that use beeswax as an ingredient, save this wax separately than all of the other dirty old brown brood combs that you're melting down because this is the, the cleanest, purest wax that you're going to want to use. Plus, it often smells a lot like honey. But we extract the honey and we remove it from the comb and then we keep the comb intact and the bees can use that comb again next season, which is a big advantage for the bees because they have to cr create, it, they have to consume, bees consume about one pound of honey in order to make about two ounces of beeswax. So every comb that you preserve and put back in the hive, several ounces of beeswax that they're gonna to use to make those combs, that's several pounds of honey they don't have to, to eat up. They can just simply store it in the combs they already have. So that bee there is primed to make wax. So you can see where it's coming out of her wax glands. Of course, when you extract honey, that requires a little additional equipment and it starts to get a little bit expensive. So this is the basic setup for, for a hobbyist, a hand cranked extractor, this is an uncapping tub, some filterers, and a couple of extra tools here, a knife and a fork. A big extractor can cost you well over a grand. For an appliance you're going to use maybe one day out of the entire year. Uh, you can get a whole kit like this, this will do maybe two combs at a time, turns it into an all-day project for a couple of hives, but still, that's quite a bit of money. Join your local bee club, because most of the clubs own an extractor, and you pay $10, $15 a year to be a member of your local bee club, and then you can sign up on the list and borrow the extractor, and clean it up, and then you take it to the next person on the list. That's a pretty good deal. Plus, when you're a member of a bee club, you get to meet lots of other beekeepers, many of whom own extractors, and you can mooch off of them for a few years. Once you've decided, yeah, beekeeping is something that I want to do, you can maybe sell some honey a few years, you can save up, you can get a six, eight hundred dollars worth of extracting equipment for your own, and then you'll find out how many friends you really have because everybody wants to mooch off of you now. But, you know, that's how it works. These are uncapping knives. Uh, this is a cold knife, this is a hot knife because you plug it in, it's got a heating element and it melts right through the beeswax. So when you're cutting through the, the cappings, it just glides right through it. Like, like the proverbial hot knife through butter. When you set it down, make sure you set it in a pan of water because if you don't and you get distracted and it sits there, now it's just going to burn honey all over the outside of that knife and it's going to be really tough to, to clean it all off. These cold knives actually are what I prefer. I've got one of each and I always use this one. The tip, the good ones have a tip that curves up on the end and it's serrated and it's pretty sharp and it's got an offset handle. 
that's the one that you like. If you've got fewer than 10 or 12 hives, these work, work wonders. If you've got more than 12 hives, there's even better equipment for uncapping than just using a hand knife, but they're kind of expensive. So you take your, your comb, and then you take your uncapping tub here, and notice it's two tubs, and it's got a screen in the bottom, and then there's a, a valve down here we call a honey gate. So there's a, a bar here, and there's a nail on it. That's an important nail there. You set your comb on top of this. The wooden frame sits right on that, and that just keeps it from sliding around. But as you uncap it, you simply take your knife, and you slice right through it. Some people go up, some people go down. Depends on, on what your preference is. But you capture all of the, the, the cappings and a lot of honey in that bucket. And then you just spin it around on that nail and you do the other side. And you don't really have to put a lot of pressure on it. These serrated ones, you just wiggle and jiggle and it'll, it'll work through it. They're pretty sharp. And the reason it has that curve on the end of it is it stays right below the level of that, that uh, wooden bar there. If it didn't have that, then you'd ride along the top and you wouldn't necessarily uncap all of those cells. So if you've, the first time you do this, you're gonna butcher those combs. You're gonna take it all the way down to the foundation and maybe go all the way through. You don't wanna fillet it to the bone like a fish. You wanna just barely take the skin off, just barely take the cappings off. If there's some low spots in your comb because the comb has kind of a wavy surface or for whatever reason your knife didn't get it, you need your fork along with your knife. And you just simply stick that in and, and pop the caps off of those low spots, kind of clean up around the edges. Some people can do the whole entire comb with these really quick. I don't have that kind of skill, but some people can. So that's a pretty cheap tool, four, six bucks, so get one of those. And then once they're all uncapped, then you stick it down in your extractor. Depending on the extractor you have, they go in different ways, different arrangements, but uh, they all pretty much are, are, they're pretty obvious once you start using them. So you set them down in there and you give it a spin. And when it spins around, it flings the honey right out of the comb and it hits the inside of this barrel and drips down to the bottom. And your combs come out clean. Now you can spin that all day long and you'll never get every drop of honey out but I'll show you how to, how to take care of that in a minute. The two basic types of extractors, there's the tangential extractor and the radial extractor. And if you were to look at a honeycomb, the cross section of the comb, you notice that the cells are not horizontal. They actually turn up just a little bit, about 14 degrees. And bees have figured out over the eons that that's just right with the surface tension of nectar that when they put the nectar in, it doesn't run out. So it all stays inside and you can use that to extract a little bit faster. The tangential extractors are the old-fashioned kind. So when you put the combs in and you spin it around, the honey on the outside edge of the comb goes out really easily, but the honey on the inside is pressed against the middle of the comb. And if you spin it too fast, you create a lot of pressure that's very heavy, and you're gonna have a blowout, and you're gonna blow all the comb out of your frame. And this is why Grandpa always wired his beeswax foundation, because it gives a lot of strength to that comb, and it's to, to put up with all the pressure it's in when, under when we're extracting it this way. Now you have to take that comb out, physically turn it over and put it back in, and do the other side. And when you're doing it the, the second time, you can go a lot faster because you don't have all that weight pushing up against the middle of it. Sometimes people do it gently, turn it over, do it really vigorously, then turn it back and do the first side again really fast. So it takes a little while to do this, depending on how many you can fit in your extractor. The radial extractors take advantage of the fact that there's a little bit of an angle to those cells, and you put them all in this way, where the top bar is to the outside, so when you spin it around, that honey flows down that incline, and it's forced out into the barrel. So you can uncap, or you can, you can extract both sides at the same time, and it's not under quite as much pressure. With either one of these, it's gotta be well balanced because if you've, if you've got an odd number of combs and you got one on one side and not on the other, that thing is gonna try to walk away like a, an unhappy washing machine that, that you're, you've got a big blanket in or something. Uh, so you gotta make sure that if, if you're down to the last few, you space them out to uh, where it, it's as balanced as possible or you have to just kinda go slow on that very last one. Now, you've been working almost two years 
all the blood, sweat, and tears, the stings, the heartache, the backache. You've been cranking this thing all morning long. You're ready for some honey. You look down in there and there's like this much. And you think, what a jip. I can't believe I've done all that work for so little. Well, all this honey is in there, but it's on the inside of that barrel. And it's slowly dripping down because it's hot outside. It's July and you brought it in the kitchen where it's air conditioned. And honey gets thick when it gets cold. And it takes forever to get down to the bottom. So finally, you open that valve, you open that honey gate, and everybody stands around, and everybody's got their finger ready because they want to be the first one to get a taste. My children eat more sugar on honey day than they do the day after Halloween, but it gives them the energy to crank that thing all day long. <laughs> You'll notice when the honey starts pouring out that your container fills right up. There's a lot more honey in there than you thought. Wait a minute. It's getting full. Quick, get me another pan. Get me another bucket. Empty the sugar bowl. Dump out the cat's bowl. Everything suddenly is full of honey. And it's not just honey. There's a lot of other stuff in there. There's beeswax in there. There's a little wooden splinter or two that you shaved off of a frame. There's a hive beetle. Uh, there's a bee. There's part of a bee. A couple of wings, a couple of legs in there. But don't worry, honey is naturally antiseptic. It kills germs on contact. It's one of the cleanest things out there. You can use it for medicine. And so uh, it's easy to strain all of that stuff out. Just about everything in here is lighter than beeswax, or lighter than honey. Honey is heavier, so all the rest of that is gonna float up to the top. So you grab your little tiny kitchen strainer there. That's not gonna last very long. You need something big. And they make special ones just for honey. They stack up, there's different sizes. So there's a coarse one on the top that collects the big stuff and a two or three finer ones down underneath. So that by the time the honey gets all the way through, that is some really clean stuff. And uh, it, it's gonna, gonna look very pure and you can save all the bits of wax and other stuff out of it. Uh, again, this is one of those uh, nylon bags for straining paint. Uh, this makes a great honey strainer. If you're on a budget, you can go in and get some, uh, get some pantyhose legs. Sometimes they look at you funny guys when you, you start buying a bunch of pantyhose, but you know, in this day and age, I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> People used to use cheesecloth, uh, but that's not really recommended because uh, cheesecloth is made of, of natural fibers, they're all woven together, and you start dumping honey through it, it actually takes out the big chunks of wax and stuff, but you probably are putting microscopic fibers into your honey, which is going to uh, increase the rate at which it crystallizes. But uh, nylon, synthetic stuff, it's, it's these synthetic fibers uh, are not going to do that. And they're tiny, and you can stretch it over just about any size container, and you can filter out a lot of stuff from that. When you extract honey, you're whipping a lot of air into the honey. And so if you were to pour it directly from the extractor into bottles, you're gonna have all these bubbles. It won't take long for them to all move up to the top. And then you have this layer of foam at the top and it looks kind of unappealing. And little tiny bits of beeswax that have made it through your filters and, and other things, but it just doesn't look very pretty. So if you're producing a product for sale, then uh, you want it to, to look as nice as possible. What, what you need to do is uh, put it in what's called an, a, a settling tank. And so you can get just a five gallon bucket with a, a gate at the bottom, or you can get bigger tanks, but you let it sit in there for, um, 72 hours or so, and pretty much anything that's not honey floats to the top, and then you can bottle it off of the bottom. Even if you've only got one five gallon bucket to do that, you can get about 30 pounds of honey, and by the time it gets down, if you start pulling bubbles out, that just shut it off, fill it with honey again out of whatever buckets you've got, whatever tank you have, and let it settle again, and then uh, you, can, you can bottle again off of it. But that ensures that the honey that you get is a fine final product. And this is really what you've been working for. Yeah, we like to eat honey, but chances are you're gonna have a little bit more than you need. Whether you wanna sell it or give it away, you still want it to look good. And good, fresh, local honey sells itself. You don't have to advertise anything else except fresh, local honey. 
Raw honey, that's the other key word. People want raw honey. They don't want honey from the supermarket that's been filtered and pasteurized and processed with heat. They want raw local honey. Filtered is not the same as strained. We strain out those big chunks, we settle it, but honey that's been filtered has been put through a microscopic filter that draws out even pollen grains. And that's to preserve it, uh, its shelf life. It, it won't crystallize near as fast if it has uh, all the pollen and, and tiny particles removed. Your honey that's raw and unfiltered, it is gonna crystallize, but you just have to let your, your customers know that it's not spoiled. Just put that container in warm water, melt those crystals, it, it'll be good as new. Now, when everything is all sticky, it, everything in your home is covered in honey, the cat stuck to the side of the refrigerator, you got a puddle on the floor, and every bucket, everything in your kitchen is sticky, take it all outside now, and your bees will happily clean it up. It's like getting an income tax return for them, right? You pay thousands to the government, you get a couple hundred dollars back, and you think, wow, all right, what a deal. It's the same way with the bees. You've taken hundreds of pounds of honey, and they scrape up a few ounces and take back, and they think, all right, look at this, guys, free food. So you can take your honey supers out. We call these wet supers. After you've extracted them, you've gotten every drop you can, there's still honey on them. Put them outside well away from your beehives. If you've got neighbors around, again, be careful where you set them, but at least 20 yards away from your hives if you can. Otherwise, after they've licked them clean, they might start robbing other hives. You don't want that to happen, but a few bees will discover it. They go back home, they tell the rest, they'll all be over here, and they will be all over all of those licking up every drop of honey in a couple of days. You'll also get ants on there and yellow jackets and other things, so be mindful of that. You can stack them up like this. You can put out your knives and everything else. Put them right outside a window. Everybody will be amazed at watching the bees work. Uh, I used to put my extractor out for them to clean, but uh, I've decided not to do that because I wound up with so many bees down inside of it. It just becomes this big hot metal can and they get stuck on the inside and there was just too many dead bees and I felt bad. But honey is easy to clean up. It dissolves in water very easily, so just take your garden hose and rinse out the inside of your extractor. That's really all you need to do. Put it away once it's dry. Next year when you get it out, wash it really good with soap and water, get all the dust out and everything, and it'll be ready to go once it's dry. So do that a couple of days before you're gonna extract, make sure that it's dry, but it's real easy to clean it up. Everything else, you can let it sit out for a couple of days, they'll clean it up, and then uh, you can wash it. And uh, as far as, as all of these combs, they are very valuable. Beeswax honeycombs are strong. It's paper thin, but it holds a tremendous amount of weight. They're also very delicate. If they gets too hot, they will just deform and melt and turn to mush, but they're very valuable. So you wanna preserve those. If you've got a big chest freezer, you can, you can store them in there as long as you're really careful, but if you take them out while they're frozen, you just tap them and they'll shatter like fine crystal. So you don't wanna do that. So store them in a cool, dry place. If there's a lot of humidity, sometimes they will grow mold on them, especially if any of these cells have pollen in them, which they do sometimes. You'll get mold growing all over it, so you don't wanna do that. And you gotta keep them safe from these darn little bugs called wax moths. It's a, a moth that lays a caterpillar that will actually consume all of your beeswax. Any questions? <laughs>